Yo, what is going on everybody? Dan Trimpty here, and welcome back to my tutorial series, Browser Noise. This is tutorial number 10, and as I'm sure you all recognize at this point, you could probably go ahead and experiment making beats, so let's do that. I'm gonna just flip some zeros to ones, maybe expand the beat a little bit so it's not just a loop of four notes, so let's try that. There's eight. 12, 16, and do the same thing for each. And I'll just speed this up and make a cool beat. This is awesome. But let's make a user interface so that Visitors to your website don't have to actually manipulate ones and zeros in an array. That is silly. Let's get to it. First, I want to very quickly create a slider so that we can control our tempo. So we'll declare a variable like, I don't know, BPM control. Now I want to drop down to where we do set our tempo and go ahead and set BPM control equal to create slider. As you already know, create slider takes four arguments. The first two arguments are going to be the range of the slider, and we can start thinking about what the range of our metronome wants to be and use those. Um, typically, a metronome has a range of something like 30 to 300, and, you know, we could do whatever we want, so let's go ahead and put a 600 there. Next, we're going to initialize the slider to something like 80, and then use a step size of 1. Now I want to position BPM control, so we'll set it to something like, I don't know, 10. And we, we're going to want to draw a canvas eventually, at, which is gonna have a height of 60, so we'll put it at 70 on the Y axis. Now we can hit run and see where that is, great. Now we'll create a listener by calling bpmcontrol.input and define a callback function that passes the value of the slider into drums.setBPM. Now we'll keep this drums.setBPM down here so that we can have it initialized to the same thing that our slider is initialized to. Now let's hit that run button, press the spacebar. Okay, awesome. We can grab this handle, slow that down, and speed it up. Now let's build the matrix that we're going to interact with. Let's jump to our canvas and go ahead and resize it to 320 on the X and 60 on the Y. Then at the very end of our setup function, let's go ahead and draw a background and we'll initialize that to 80, a dark gray. Hit run, and you'll see now we have a canvas. So on top of the background that we just made, I want a lot of things to happen. I'm trying to draw a grid, I guess, right? I want 16 squares on the x-axis, and I want three squares on the y-axis, so I want like a 16 by three grid. There's a few ways to do this. I can either make a bunch of squares or we can actually just draw the lines that are intersecting. So if we had a bunch of lines, vertical lines that intersected with horizontal lines, they would look like a, a grid of squares. Does that make sense? So let's do that. When we draw those lines, let's make it so that they are thick gray lines. So we'll set the stroke to gray and then we'll set stroke weight to, I don't know, two. Next, let's make a for loop so that we can draw a bunch of lines all in one line of code. So we'll say let i equals zero, i is less than, you know what, we could say 16 here, but if it's something that we want to eventually update, I might just make a variable right now. We'll say beat length and then i plus plus and then open and close curly braces, and this is where we'll draw our line function. But before we do that, we need to declare a variable called let beat length, and then go ahead and initialize beat length to 16. Cool. Now let's drop back down and talk about that line function. It's gonna take four arguments. The first two are gonna be the coordinates for the beginning point. So 
we'll say start x, start y, and then the last two arguments are going to be the end point, so we'll say end x, end y, and one thing we can do is pass an i for our x values, like so, and then for our y values, we'll put in a zero for the top of the canvas, and we'll make those lines be vertical lines and draw them to the height of the canvas. And if we run that, you'll see we have something that looks like a gray block at the beginning. And this isn't a block, it's actually a bunch of lines stacked up on top of each other. So, and I can show you that it's a bunch of lines by multiplying each i by 10, hitting run, and you'll see now that they are sort of spread out. Cool, now what we wanna do is kinda, instead of multiplying it by 10, we wanna multiply it by something so that it spans across the width of our canvas. And so what we could do is sort of divide width into 16 parts, so width over 16, and instead of uh, multiplying i by 10 for each of these x values, we'll multiply i by width over 16 or beat length. So we'll do that for both of these cases and hit run and see what that does. Boom. If you look closely, you'll notice that we have 16 lines, but we actually need 17 lines in order to close this thing off. There's no line drawn at the very end, and that is an easy fix. We just go to beat length and say plus, whoops, plus one, and hit run, and now you can see there's a line there. Now let's draw our horizontal lines. Remember, we need four horizontal lines in order to have three cells in the same way that we needed 17 vertical lines to have 16 cells. So we'll go ahead and make a loop like we did before. Let i equals zero, i is less than four, i plus plus, and then in here we'll draw a line. And our starting x will be zero, our starting y will for now make it an i, our end x will be width, and our end y will be, again, i. Now let's multiply i by height over 3, and we'll do that for both of the y positions, like so. Hit run. We have a grid. Fabulous. Now what I want to do right now is draw a circle in each cell. These are going to represent the notes. Now, we're going to start by filling the entire grid with cells and then get rid of the ones that aren't notes later. So. We're gonna do this by, uh, you're probably gonna hate me, making another for loop. i is less than beat length, i plus plus, and then inside here, we'll do this row by row, but um, we're going to draw an ellipse, okay? If we want a circle, an ellipse takes three arguments. The first two are the x, y coordinates, of course, and then the third one is the diameter. For our x, we'll do as we have done, i times width over beat length. And then our y, let's, let's just have it as a zero for now, and our diameter will be 10 pixels. Let's hit run and check that out. As you'll see, we have circles, but they're kind of positioned off center. We want them to sit in the center of the grid. So we need to move all of these circles to the right by half of the cell width, and then we need to move them all downwards by half of the cell height. So let's do that. We'll offset them by half of the cell width, which is width over beat length. All right, let's hit run, and great. They are shifted over to the right, but now we need to shift them down. And I want you to think about how much we shift them down because Here's the thing, we're drawing these circles from the center of the circle. Right now, the center of the circle is at zero. If we wanted to draw them at a third of the height, they would end up here, right? It would be centered on this line over here. If we drew it at two thirds of the height, we would it would be centered over here. So what we want is something that is exactly the half of a third of the height, which we can represent by height over six. So let's change zero to height over six and see what that does. When we hit run, boom. Now let's copy and paste this three times. For our second row, instead of drawing it at height over six, we'll draw it at height over two because we want it to be directly in the center. And then let's just look at that real quick. 
Yeah, very good. Now for our third one, we want it to draw, I guess, is at the 5 6 point of our height. So the easiest way to do that is height times 5 over 6. Hit run. Boom. And while we're at it, I think we should go ahead and get rid of a stroke. So we'll say no stroke and run that. Very, very good. All right. You're probably thinking, this is lovely. But, um, Mr. Browser Noise, <laughs> I guess that's my name, it doesn't represent our beat. You're absolutely correct. But here's the thing. We can, while we're looping to draw these cells, we can simultaneously compare our loop index with the index of each of our arrays, if that makes sense. So then we can use an if statement to create a condition where we only draw circles when the value at the index is a one and then filter out the rest. If we see a zero, we don't draw. So for each row of our ellipses, we'll have an if statement and we'll only draw that ellipse if our pattern at index i is a one. And then we'll wrap our curly braces around that. Uh, let me give myself a little more room. If cpat at index i is one, draw a circle. If uh, bpat at index i is one, draw our base. Now let's hit the run button. That's our drum pattern, amazing. All right, one last thing, and then we'll call it the end of the tutorial. Look how many times we've written with over beat length. It's like a million times. It's, I guess it's eight times, but <laughs> close enough. So whenever you see yourself writing that sort of thing over and over again, think, what is that thing? Is it a constant? Like when you load the page, is it always going to be the same? In this case, yes. We determine the width of the canvas and we also determine the sort of quantity of cells and so the beat length is always going to be the same why don't we just hold that value in a variable and call it when needed so let's go ahead and declare a variable called cell width and down here after we've determined the the width of the canvas and after we've determined the beat length at that point we can say cell width equals, uh, I guess, width over beat length. Now we can jump down here again and grab every time we say width over beat length, hit command D eight times or a million times and say cell width. Run that and it will continue to work just as we had it. Not only does it make your code more concise, but it also improves the performance a little bit. Because if you think about it, now the browser only has to make that calculation once and then simply recall it from memory every time it sees that variable. Cool? Okay. There's still a few more things we need to do before we're done with this project. We need to draw a cursor on every sequence step. And we also need to make it so that the user can interact with our canvas. But that's all for today. I'll see you later. Bye.